a reading from the first letter of Peter, starting at chapter 1, verse 1 through verse 9. Peter, an apostle of Jesus Christ, to the exiles of the dispersion in Pontus, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, and Bithynia, who have been chosen and destined by God the Father and sanctified by the Spirit to be obedient to Jesus Christ and to be sprinkled with his blood. May grace and peace be yours in abundance. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. By his great mercy, he has given us a new birth into a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead and into an inheritance that is imperishable, undefiled, and unfading, kept in heaven for you, who are being protected by the power of God through faith, for a salvation ready to be revealed in the last time. In this you rejoice, even if for now, for a little while, you have had to suffer various trials, so that the genuineness of your faith, being more precious than gold, and that, though perishable, is tested by fire, may be found to result in praise and glory and honor when Jesus Christ is revealed. Although you have not seen him, you love him. And even though you do not see him now, you believe in him and rejoice with an indescribable and glorious joy, for you are receiving the outcome of your faith, the salvation of your souls. May God add a blessing to the reading of his holy word. I'm Rev. Jason Wells. I'm the Executive Director of the New Hampshire Council of Churches. The Council of Churches is an organization with nine member denominations. Uh, of those denominations, there are nearly 400 churches in the state of New Hampshire. Uh, among them are American Baptists, Episcopalians, Greek Orthodox, Lutherans, Methodists, Presbyterians, Quakers, Unitarians, and the United Church of Christ. And this morning, we take a look at this reading from uh, 1 Peter. The opening of his letter uh, is a letter written uh, by that same apostle, that same disciple of Jesus who walked with him from the early days being called from the shores of Galilee and Capernaum, who followed him through Holy Week into the betrayal, to the tomb, and to Easter morning. And here, many years later in Peter's life, he's offering his directions, his guidance, his oversight to the churches. And these many churches that he's writing to, he says, are the exiles, the exiled in the dispersion of Pontus, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, and Bithynia. These are naming Roman provinces. We can get a sense that in these Roman provinces, there are many churches, many places where there are Christian faithful in all of these cities and towns and villages. And we know that he's right to call them a dispersion. They're scattered out there, scattered across a large area, lots of provinces, uh, an area that would almost add up to the size of Texas. We know that they're scattered out there so far apart from one another that there's no way they can be together. And he also describes them as an exile, the exile of the dispersion. We remember that uh, we think back to the biblical exile that we read about in 2 Kings and Daniel and the other books of the Bible. We remember that there was a time when the people of Israel had the temple destroyed, when they were carried off into the land of Babylon. And in that period of exile, Peter now draws this new Christian situation. He gives them an image to remember this different world they find themselves in. A world where they are far from the Jerusalem that Peter lived in. They're far from the Capernaum in the Galilee that he grew up in. They're in a world that is strange and is changed. A world that is different and is keeping them apart from each other. And as we think of the advice that Peter's starting to give to them in this letter, we might think of how much we need that same kind of counsel, because we see ourselves in a world of an exile, of a dispersion. 
We see churches that are scattered right now as we meet online, unable to be with one another in person. We see a landscape in our faith, in our spiritual communities of a world that is changed much in the same way. It's a world that is strange to us. It is a world that is different and changed. Through the work of the Council of Churches, I've spent much time in the past uh, couple of weeks talking to clergy from big churches and small churches all across our state, all of our different denominations. And I've heard from the many pastors, the new kinds of uh, situations they're finding themselves in, being disoriented. They're sharing stories from their congregations of their people who uh, made their way through the end of the season of Lent, made it through Palm Sunday and on their way to Easter, and found everything different and not always for the better. In their celebration of Easter, I heard one clergy person, one pastor in a church uh, over in Londonderry, who said that uh, his church, uh, they celebrated Easter on Sunday morning. Uh, they, had, they got to sing the songs. They gathered on Zoom. They had their prayers. They sang their songs. It was a little different, but it had its own joys to it. And he said, but by that afternoon, once the worship was over, it felt like, he said, we went right back to Lent, that we had gone back to shutting ourselves in our homes, uh, wondering what groceries we could scrounge up for the coming week, and how we were going to get our kids through their schooling uh, at, at their distance education. Gone right back from the joys of Easter, plunged into Lent. Many pastors are talking about the challenges of serving and of caring for their communities, of trying to offer um, in some cases, pastoral counseling to people in hospitals when you can't actually go in, of trying to offer prayers at the time of death over the telephone, of trying to organize graveside burials with Zoom calls. It's a world that is definitely changed and strange. It's unusual. And yet, at the same time, we know that things are changing. It's not just being thrust into a different world. We know our, our churches are changing by having being now ready with the technologies in a new way for prayer and Bible study. We're starting to watch uh, clergy and pastors and churches reach out to each other in new ways. They're contacting and checking in on each other in ways they haven't before. And I even heard another pastor, this one from Concord, uh, she had said that it would be a great shame that if we went through this whole time together, we all walked through these challenges, faced these new changed and strange situations. And if all we did was stop, we hit pause on the video that was our churches. And then in a few weeks, we came back to our church buildings and we just hit play again on the same old video. That we just kept doing everything we used to do as though nothing had ever happened. That there's a sense of an opportunity of things that are happening and we hope we don't lose them. Now, in the midst of a world that is both that changed and strange world, we should start looking back to the scriptures. Whenever we're looking for that guidance, uh, the word that Peter spoke to those churches of Asia is a word that applies to us in our churches now. Uh, when we look to other examples from the scripture, Peter mentions the exile. Uh, we start to find the examples of how people of faith, people of their faith in the God of Israel, uh, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, have done it before. The theologian uh, Michael Frost uh, has a book called Exiles, where he takes up exactly that theme. And he looks at the story of the Babylonian exile, the time when the temple was gone, there was no more worship the way the people of Israel had known it before. They were taken into Babylon, into a strange and foreign culture. And they needed to find a new way because the old ways were not accessible to them. They needed to find a new way to make their expression that they were the people of God. To make known that they were the Jews, that they were the people of Israel. And he noted two things in particular in his book about what happened in that time. Number one, in the period of exile, there was a return and a focus on the primal, dangerous story 
on the foundational stories, on the stories of faith that were most fundamental. It's in the time of exile that the Jewish people centered so strongly and pulled themselves so closely back to the story of Exodus, the story of Passover, the primal story of the Torah, the primal story of the scriptures. It was also a dangerous story that when you're in a foreign land under the domination of a tyrant like Nebuchadnezzar, to refocus yourself on the story of the tyrant of Egypt and how God was victorious there. But they returned, first of all, to the most foundational faith stories. And second of all, they revitalized the practices of faith. They recreated them all over again. They no longer had the temple. They no longer had the system of priests and sacrifices that they were used to. The Levites who would sing the Psalms in the, in the temple were gone. But new faith practices took a new meaning and new dimension. They reinvented what it meant and put new emphasis on the practice of observing the Sabbath. That on that Friday night, as Sabbath would come, they light a candle, they eat the bread, they drink the wine, and they tell the story of why they take a day of rest. Because God delivered them from exile in Egypt. They renewed the practice of Passover, of telling the stories, of having the Seder meal, of sharing the dinner, and being with one another. Both of them practices of telling the primal story and doing it in the home, no longer in the temple, no longer with the old practices, but with new practices. These were the things that strengthened the faith of the Jews in exile. And so as we start to read that letter from Peter, he starts by addressing that changed and strange world. He starts to address the exiles, the people who are scattered, the people in dispersion, uh, scattered all over uh, that enormous region. And the first thing that he says to them is, Blessed be our God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. By his great mercy, he has given us a new birth into a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. To refocus on the central story, the death of Jesus and his resurrection, the power with which God raised him up on the first Easter. We remember the primal, central, and sometimes even dangerous story of the resurrection of Jesus. And then he moves on, uh, not just to center on the story, but to remind them that there will be trouble, there will be trials, there will be difficulties. But through all of this, God will be there to change you. That the transformation is what happens next. The rest of the chapter, the rest of the portion that we had just read, in this we rejoice, even if for now we suffer for a little while, so that the genuineness of our faith can be shown, that we recenter on that primal and central story of the gospel. And these things will test us and try us, but only in the way that silver and gold are tried in a fire, that they are made more pure, they are made changed and different by being tried. And by the, those practices of faith, which are meant to change us and transform us, we can bring that right back because we know that we have what we need already. We can let ourselves be open to being changed by this time of our exile and dispersion in a period of pandemic in our homes. We can let ourselves be changed. We can open ourselves to how God will be changing us and how God will be changing our churches. And once again, from the perspective in the council, I've been talking to the churches and talking to the clergy and the pastors who are in them. It's been marvelous for me to sit and almost every day I check in with the Facebook feeds of uh, so many of our those 400 congregations. And I'm seeing uh, Facebook Live posts almost every day. Churches are having prayer gatherings, they're having Bible studies, they're getting together in various forms for prayer and enriching their faith. Maybe in ways that we never would have made the time to drive to church to physically be there for a Bible study or a prayer group, but... Those even small churches are having seven or eight people get together every day for prayer and for spiritual practices like Bible reflection. We're seeing in many cases as churches are reaching out to their members 
Uh, they're reaching out to those uh, lists of members maybe they haven't heard from in a long time. And they're starting to see old, friendly, familiar faces who are once again showing up in those Zoom calls for worship. They're getting those pastoral check-in phone calls and getting reconnected to the spiritual communities in their churches they thought they had lost touch with. They're starting to see, in many cases, uh, new people altogether. Uh, many clergy have been saying that they're noticing there's people on their Zoom calls who they've never seen before. But people are starting now to turn their attention to faith. And finally, I think there is, in this moment, we're seeing the ways in which we are being changed. People are checking in with their spiritual practices more often. Communities are being changed when we reach out to people old and new. We've made a massive push to move ourselves to online worship, to train ourselves to be ready for them. And these things are changing us. They're changing for the better. Like that one pastor in Concord had said, she hoped that we don't just hit pause on the way we used to do church and then hit play someday and forget that every day we got together to pray, that every day people were getting together to read the Bible, that every day we were reaching out to people old and new and engaging all the more deeply with that primal story of our faith, with the story of Jesus Christ crucified and resurrected. Because these things will change us. We shouldn't be hitting play to replay the old tape that we've been playing for so many years. These things ought to be changing us and deepening us, as Peter says, to the churches of Asia, as he says to our churches right now. And as he mentions that, he says that we will be changed the way that silver and gold are tested in a fire. I'll close with just one short story from a pastor I knew when I was serving a church in Manchester. This was uh, Uzziah. And Pastor Uzziah had come to Manchester, New Hampshire from Uganda. He was working on a degree in urban development that he was going to take back to Uganda to uh, minister better to his people there. And he told a story to us one time that when he was still in Uganda, he had stopped in a village and he saw a silversmith working with the fire, exactly like Peter had described it. And he said he saw that silversmith turning the piece of silver, a chain, uh, through the flame and was watching as beads of liquid would bead up and fall off of the chain of this dark liquid that would kind of fall off of the silver as it was being tried and tested in the fire, as it was being made more clean and more pure and more uh, true to the silver that it was. And Uzziah had to ask, how do you know when you're done putting it in the fire? How do you know when the silver is ready, when it's clean, when it's pure? How do you know when it's done being tested in the fire? And the silversmith said, the silver is done when I look at it and I can see my image in it. We are being tested and tried. We may be going through the fires, but we know through the advice of Peter, when we bring back ourselves to that central story of the gospel, of the resurrection of Jesus from the dead, when we carry out these new things, God will be changing us, but we will be changed to be brought more and more into his wonderful image. Amen.